right? The thing about ecosystems, there we, we have a bunch of them. And by the way, you'll see lots of pictures of little people. They're all related to me. <laughs> uh, but mountain streams, of course, have ecosystems, are ecosystems. Um, tidal marshes are ecosystems. Behind your, your, your house, behind our house, is a little backyard from this Charlie. Uh, Luis knows Charlie pretty well. And then you don't really think about it, but even things like parking lots have the possibility of, of, of providing some sort of ecosystem service, I guess. And there they are enjoying that just down the street from where we live. Okay. So stormwater, and people say, how in the world is a parking lot runoff tie into ecosystems? And well, we have to treat parking lot runoff. It's required. And the practices that are put in the ground is, is called green infrastructure or stormwater green infrastructure. And a lot of it is vegetated, like a green roof right out there. All right. Um, you have some swales along the front, uh, the front face of, of this facility here. Constructed wetlands, fire retention, even filter strips of grass. They're all stormwater control measures. And yet, because they are vegetated, they are biological, they also provide, they're all small ecosystems, and therefore they provide ecosystem services. Now, for those of you, have, have, have all of you heard, because usually when they give a talk to engineers, <coughs> you know, 80% of the group is like, I, I, what are you talking about, right? <laughs> Peter, have you heard of them? Ecosystem services? You can say yeah. no. Crap. Okay, great. Well, good for you. So the idea is, and this is actually politically, for me, a very important thing that I like to hammer home, and I truly mean politically, like in the, in the greater world's politics, is these are things that people get that we derived from naturally occurring, or, 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 or basically for ecosystems, natural places. And there, but I'd like to focus on that people are actually a deriving benefit. So is it not in our interest, you and your constituents, those who are voters, to think about things that we know that your constituents can, in fact, benefit from? And some of the ecosystem services that we get include some of the big ones, things that we study, you know, we think about water quality, we think about hydrologic regulation. That, that's what motivates us in the engineering sense to put these practices in the ground. And then there are other things like climate regulation and refugia and production of materials and, and, and spiritual places you can create, education, recreation. So all these things have the, have any, any ecosystem has the ability to produce some or all of these things. All right. And importantly, all of these have value. One of these that we were talking about this morning, the uh, three amigos here, uh, was the, if you really want smart stuff to happen, if we really want to see widespread use of something like green stormwater infrastructure, it is incumbent that the private sector sees value in it and they, and they can account for that value. All right, we'll come back to that in a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about green infrastructure, stormwater infrastructure, and the ecosystem services that they provide. When we design a system, all right, as an engineer, we look at water treatment, that is, can I clean the water that runoff is coming in, and can I regulate the hydrology of it such that people are not getting flooded, streams are not getting blown out and stuff like that, all right? So we design our systems to do those two things. But in concert with that, we also have these other benefits that to some extent are happening. And what essentially the pur purpose of my presentation today is to go through, yes, these two things, which is what we are precisely designing our practices to do, but then also touch on the possibility and the potential of all these other benefits and, 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 and lay out some folks, some research that either happened at NC State or other places um, that kind of support the idea of maybe we should start like, taking a more holistic view of how these storm water, and by I should also point out, these type of things are happening right here at CORE, right? And that, and that to me is one of the reasons why I was so excited, was so excited to work with Steve and Luis when he was here, and we continued to work with Luis now he's in Spain, is that so many things that I know we need to do in the future to get broad acceptance of the right thing to do from a stormwater perspective, you know, the, the ability to actually reach and, and, and find out some of these things can, can happen right here. This is a great place for me uh, to collaborate. All right, so let's talk about the basics. And I break the basics into two things. No matter where you go across the globe, people are worried about um, the role of stormwater control measures to mitigate floods. And they're also worried about retaining sediment and eliminating sediment that's coming into, um, into estuaries, 
sediment often being sort of the surrogate pol pollutant for all pollutants that we're trying to get rid of. All right, so one of the ways, by the way, you think this was a problem? It's a big problem. You know what this person had to do? This person had to move. Why did this person have to move, relocate his or her home? Talk about a flimsy bridge. Talk about needing some real engineering. That's backyard, this is truly backyard engineering. Um, the reason this person had to move was that a new development had gone in upstream and it sent so much water, essentially unchecked water, that it was blowing out the banks and basically made this person's property no longer viable. Now that is an engineering failure, okay? So one of the ways you can deal with flooding, all right, or unstable banks, for example, is you can, you can really mitigate, you can regulate the amount of water that leaves a site. That's what happened here. We had this site here that you see in this red, um, here, uh, red, uh, what do you call it, polynomial? Polygon. Polygon, that's exactly what I was wondering. Thank you, this is great. And this may be an interactive presentation for all we know. Okay, so a red polygon, and then you have this blue one down here. The red one used to be a nice patch of wood. And the city of Raleigh, which by the way is named for Sir Walter, all right? The city of Raleigh, the state capital of North Carolina, uh, they, they are like, we don't want this woods being taken out. And the, and, but you might guess that this, this patch of woods had a very high value to it uh, in terms of how much the land would sell for and it was surrounded by. And so the developer is like, we'll do whatever you want. Just please let us develop it. And it's like, all right, we want you to maintain natural hydrology. Now, what does that mean to say maintain natural hydrology? Well, they're basically saying whatever amount of runoff that you're getting from that patch of woods, well, that's what you're allowed to have on an annual basis um, from your development. And we have an inclination as what fraction of rainfall would run off in a Raleigh, North Carolina. And that gets, we get about a thousand, a little bit over a thousand millimeters, between a thousand and 1100 millimeters of rain a year. What fraction of those thousand-ish millimeters of rainfall actually runs off woods in Raleigh, North Carolina? You guys want to take a stab at it? That's, we're going to stop the discussion right there. That's exactly right. Five percent. That's great. Great job, Sue. Not that you're looking to get an A, you just got one. Now. Okay, so five percent. Now, how much runoff do you think you'd normally have from a development? Yeah, between anywhere between, depends on what type of controls are employed, but eight, 50 percent, 80 percent, somewhere in there. Okay, so. <clears throat> But I'm a believer, I actually am a believer, when you put the right framework on things, or letting the market speak, all right? If it was not possible to maintain 5%, what would that developer have done? I can say he, because I was a guy, would have walked away, right? Why, why do something you can't meet, right? So instead, and there's your 5%. So instead, the developer said, okay, we'll try that. And they used what we refer to as green infrastructure uh, in some, to some extent. So you have your above ground, uh, this is a, a bioretention facility. They had some swales that were present, but then also very, very important, they had a, a, a rainwater harvesting system where the entire rooftop went into either this show tank or to actually the real tank where the harvesting was, most of the water was being stored. Used to flush toilets inside, used to irrigate some of the lawn. And then, then the real bulk of it was what water was not able to be captured by the rainwater harvest system, went into a massive underground detention uh, tank, and then a, a, a very large infiltration gallery. The infiltration gallery and detention tank were detention tank is here, and the infiltration gallery was here. All right. And then, and here's the thing, after they did all that, then NC State was required, they made a broker a deal that our university to go in and we had to monitor it to see if they did what they said they were going to do, all right? Uh, we would call that the pucker factor, like you, you sort of pucker up if you're the designer. Uh, and interestingly, at least for me, across the street, we had a more traditional, conventional development that did have a swale, all right, but all stormwater has, all new development has something in North Carolina, 
all right? And then a dry pond, if I said it would, that would you know, get water in it during a storm event and then dewater. So we monitor this, and we monitor this, all right? Now let's see what we got. Now the site that was conventionally developed, remember we said how much water runs off that? Well, about 50%. One of every two drops found the rain. And, and, and this, what the runoff coefficient is in this particular term is annually how much of the water finds its way off a of property. And that number, by the way, was in line, generally, with other studies that had been conducted in the eastern part of the United States, places that got roughly 1,000 millimeters of rain a year, 1,000 to 1,200, okay? Now, the LID site that we had, the Green Infrastructure site, instead of having 50% of the water runoff, or even instead of having 5% of the water runoff, we were down to 2%. Now, that's pretty good. And, and in fact, it beat every other development uh, associated with uh, preserving a natural hydrologic condition that had been tested in the eastern part of the United States. And so the question is, and it, it even beat that 5%. Now, the, que the question is, how do you beat 5%? How did you beat what nature would provide? And one thing nature does not have, ready, are two meters of driving head. Because that's what, how much water was being stored in those underground tanks. And that's the amount of pressure that was being placed on the underlying soil to push the water into the ground. Okay, and so there are times if you have the right sort of condition that you can outperform what you might expect in terms of in terms of certain elements. Yes, sir. You would certainly argue that they have in fact had an environmental impact there because they've actually reduced the level of water moving off that site, which is then going into the catchment. So, yeah. To me, they have. Over exceeded what they were supposed to do. And right. Now they're actually having a potentially having a detrimental impact. Right. I would not argue with that. Uh, the only thing I would say is that as long if every community did exactly like this, then um, and there would be there would be a different set of environmental impacts. All this is doing is partially mitigating the damage that's done by all the other traditional developments. But you are correct that you can overdo it, and that is certainly the case here. One of the things that I will not get into is that modeling, and, and the developer, by the way, saw this, and they were very happy they had met the goal, but then they started thinking, hey, I probably spent more money than I needed to to achieve a result that was better than I had to deliver. Man, I wish I could have spent less money to achieve a result that, over the course of the study, would have actually gotten 0.05. All right, but all those points are, are silly. Okay, let's talk about another opportunity. I've had the, I've, I've had the chance to walk. In fact, I, I received a parking ticket, in fact, by coming to downtown Coventry yesterday, Center City. Uh, I was just thrilled. Welcome to Coventry. Welcome to Coventry. <laughs> Extracting money from the visitors, right? I'll explain a little bit later, but I'll explain it right now, actually. So usually, uh, uh, you know, you see a sign, if, it, if, it, if it's a handicapped parking, they have a sign up and it's in blue. At least that's how it is, of course, in America, that's what I'm used to, right? So I'm parking in here and I have a colleague that I'm driving, his mother-in-law, in fact, driving. We're parking and I'm parking in between a bunch of cars. I go to pay, I put my 50p in, actually she put her 50p in. We pay, we put it and we walk away, but comes I found out I've, I've parked and disabled. And it says disabled along the road on the road, but I would have to look down, but we were late. And you get out of your car, you run, you do it, boom, you're gone. And all of a sudden, boom, I, got, I, I haven't opened up the tank. I don't want to see how bad it is. Because I realize this is going to probably be scores of pounds like I'm going to be looking at. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You got an A, he got a D. Oh, so it could be worse, it is what you're telling yeah, me. No, no, no. no, no. 62, 62 oh, yeah, that's true. You've done that one? No, no, no. <laughs> so there's so no win no here. Because it's, it's the point I am trying to make is that, you know, <laughs> Coventry, like most British cities, is pretty tightly developed. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of pavement, all right? But there's also a desire to put trees, all right, to green it. And why not we start looking at technologies that you can take water from a hardscape actually sink it down into 
uh, raise it underground and actually support trees to survive, all right? Support trees. And so there's this technology called silver cells. You can see it going in. There may be a video associated with this, let's see. Indeed, the siren you get for free. Okay, but the idea is you have this deck and post system that you put a media in, and then this thing eventually gets capped off, okay, with the top post and then covered up. And then what you can do, as was done here, is paving was put over the top of this. So then the street that you saw in that video, the water comes in, fills up these containers with the media. The media helps filter out some of the pollutants in the water. And then the nutrients, for example, are then available for a tree that shows up after everything's up and covered over, okay? And the idea being that one, your tree will go faster, and there's plenty of studies that show that that's the case, not just for the water that's coming in, but the fact that there's a lot of place, a lot of room for root growth. And then secondly, so the tree goes faster, you have a system that's also cleaning up the water, and it blends into a tightly urbanized, a highly urbanized environment, which again, the center city of here, or or Oviedo or wherever uh, has a pretty good opportunity for it, yes. The problem there is with the service system, um, with the um, pipes and wires. Right, and your service and utilities. Yes. Yeah, you're right. you're right. And so there is a, what we showed was an ideal case, all right? Um, but even in this one, uh, this case here with the video, we did have to move some utilities along this street to actually make this work. And this was a massive, you can probably get a feel, it's multiple blocks of, um, of road restoration that occurred to put this in. So just one thing about services as well, which is <coughs> UK being as it is, um, occasionally, very occasionally, you can get a retrofit site with a, you know, with a more sustainable drainage option. And if, particularly if it's hard stuff, what they tend to do is, is have like a, like a conduit mm. area. Yeah, that's right. So it excludes the services away. That's right. And actually what that is doing, and I don't know whether it's something that's been measured in, by researchers, is it simplifies the whole thing because when it's all conventional drainage, you're having to constantly dig up high surfaces. Mm. And it causes all kinds of problems. Mm. So that's another way that the sort of best management... That's, that is interesting. You a benefit, that's yeah. interesting. <clears throat> that's interesting. Okay, so what I'm going to show you here is uh, the amount of runoff that actually was treated by this, and I'll show you the extent to which it was treated just a little bit, but essentially 80% of all the runoff that was coming down that street got diverted to this mostly subterranean. There's a tree that comes up out of it, but essentially a subterranean filter, all right? And then we did have some bypass that occurred as well, but 80% of the water gets, gets treated in what is otherwise a very difficult environment to have it get exposed. Now, I, one thing I will point out is I'll, I'll show you how well it was treated. I think I do in an upcoming, if not, you know, if I, even if I don't, I'll just say right now, it was treated very well, that the concentrations were extremely low that were discharged. Um, in fact, lower, lower than that, which you, you would find in streams that were considered to be in good, maybe not excellent, but at least in good shape. All right, the other thing I should point out is that because you're forcing all this water to pass through a filter media, the media actually helps meter out the flow. And so, because flooding is an issue, again, it's an issue pretty much worldwide, we found that while there's a pretty big range of flows coming into the cell, because so much of the water was being diverted and the flow was being metered through that media, all right, that the, amount, that the range of flow leaving the media is actually pretty low because, again, that the, the flows are being metered by the media. So again, there's these other benefits, just the fact that the tree is gonna grow. This is about blue roots and green roots. And I know that some of this work is done by some fa faculty and I guess adjunct faculty. What's Alan's exact status here? Who knows? Okay, that's um, interesting, okay. He's a university professor, he works with you know, cross faculties really. Okay, okay. I know some folks in Spain are working on this as well, but blue roots and green roots. We did a little project on blue roots and green roots, you can see. and. Here's your green roof, here's your blue roof. The idea behind the blue roof is that the water passes through, in this case, an expanded slate aggregate that is plentiful in North Carolina, all right? And then here's the green roof. We wanted to compare how, and, and the reason we might want to look at doing a blue roof in lieu of a green roof is actually very simple. Guess which one's cheaper, all right? Now, the, may, the other benefits may not be the same, but that one is cheaper. 
all right? And we found out, and one advantage of doing a blue roof and a green roof and a control roof is you know what colors to pick. Control is gray, blue is blue, and green is green. And see, cumulatively, the blue roof and the green roof performed essentially the exact same. All right, so that was a good sign. We'll come, I know we'll come back to that in just a little bit. Oh, and there is some peak flow mitigation as well. Not as, not, you know, there's some. And what I'd like to point out is you start putting these practices in, and if you always, if you want to find holes with them, well, how does, how well does it do blind? Well, you're right, you, you're not going to hit everything, all right? But there is some benefit by putting the blue roof in and the green roof in in terms of peak flow mitigation. Okay, now let's talk about nutrients. Nutrients are a really big deal, lots of different parts of the globe. The most important part for me is the, where I live, and it's a big deal in North Carolina, all right? Because we have these beautiful estuaries that serve as bathtubs for the nutrients, and then you get fish kills and the like. So one of the things that we do to try to mitigate nutrient problems is to use constructed stormwater wetlands. And the reason we pick that is that we have a bunch of naturally occurring wetlands pretty much in East North Carolina, but really all over the state, but a good chunk of East North Carolina, that have helped for millennia to, to regulate nutrient loads that are going into the estuaries. So as an engineer, as an ecological engineer, like, okay, I'm going to design a practice to try to, again, regulate the amount of nutrients that are leaving a site, we might as well appeal to the practice that Mother Nature had given us that we've actually been sort of destroying for the past 400 years, all right? So we're turning back to something that's worked that Mother Nature's given us through time. And so what you see here, each of these dots other than the, than the ref, are constructed stormwater wetlands that we had built at NC, associated with NC State that we've collected data on and we're looking at the effluent concentrations leaving those practices that we built as humans, and we compared them to this reference condition in East North Carolina from a naturally occurring wetland. And we wanted to see how our human built systems compared to a naturally occurring system. Okay, here we go. You can see these plus signs, the black plus line, all of those are the are an organic nitrogen concentration leaving the naturally occurring wetland. All the other stuff, all those other symbols, those are what was leaving the human built stormwater container wetland. And so what do you get when you look at it? You're like, it's not a carbon copy, but other than one case, it's really close, right? That I found actually rather reaffirming to not just my profession, but my whole life, right? Like my God, we can build something that is modeled on something that was given to us by Mother Nature and actually get relatively close to what Mother Nature was spitting out. I think that is fantastic. All right, some of you will point out, adroitly so, that what about this hunt? What about that one? Is that one clearly does not, and, and that is a, is a great story because that is the one wetland that we studied that was simply too small. It was about one fifth the size that, as a designer, we would have wanted it to be. So in other words, the influent concentrations overwhelmed the practice, there was, and we didn't keep the nitrogen, didn't keep the water and the nitrogen associated with the water in the practice sufficiently long so that we couldn't attain any treatment. Which then comes to say is that you do need designers, all right, to be a part of the solution. You just can't say, oh, I like the practice, let's pl plop it in here. Th that, that's fine, but the next part is let's make sure we can make it big enough, all right? So there is an important role for us as designers and as an ecological engineers specifically to help the, make, let the right thing be actually right. All right, let's go back to the blue roofs and green roofs. And here's another reason why blue roofs might actually be preferable to green roofs, to, and it depends on the composition of the practices, but this is the nitrogen load from the green roof. All right, this gray is nitrogen load from the control roof, and the blue is nitrogen load from the blue roof. What do you see here? Well, that's, that's nitrogen, here's phosphorus, same story. Phosphorus load leaving the green roof, phosphorus load leaving the blue roof, and that leaving the control roof. One of the huge issues, I've been talking about this for a long time in North Carolina, is that when people sell you a green roof, they are really hell-bent on those plants making it. I don't know about you, we struggle to have our plants do particularly well. That's just how it is, all right? Plants are doing okay out there. They're doing better than our normal one would be, all right? 
But in an effort to get those plants to take, the people who produce these roots will give you a fair amount of organic matter, compost often, for example, and you know, stuff breaks down. And as it's breaking down, it's leaching a lot of nitrogen and a lot of phosphorus. You don't have that present with a blue roof. The blue roof essentially is keeping it in tow, in check. And so there's another reason why, at least over the course of the first few years of both the blue roof and the green roof practice, that the nutrient loads being discharged from the blue roof are just a lot less than those of the green roof. And I, I, I feel pretty confident that blue roofs, I mean, blue roofs do not look as good, all right? So there's going to be, a, there's a knock on there. That I don't know how much thermal protection they provide to roofs. Like green roofs do absolutely provide. So there's a number of things, other ecosystem services I know that green roofs do provide. But for, from, if you just look at it from a stormwater perspective and a straight up economics perspective based solely on the stormwater, the roof actually starts making some sense. All right, what's going on here? Yeah, it is, it is a, a river that's on fire. You all, any of y'all like basketball? This is where LeBron James plays. All right, you guys, at least, at least Luis, as a Spaniard, follows basketball some too. Thank you. Mucho gracias, amigo. Uh, but that's where LeBron, that's in Cleveland, Ohio. All right, and the river's on fire. Now, um, that would be epic fail in the environmental engineering world. Like, you were, your river caught on fire? And uh, that was 1969. In um, 1972, the Clean Water Act was passed in America. And basically all stormwater treatment will trace its route back to the Clean Water Act. And the Clean Water Act was passed in great part, it was passed due to public pressure, in great part promulgated by this photo being on the cover of Life magazine. And for those of you that don't know much about Life Magazine, but you know a lot about Instagram and Facebook, this was before Instagram, this was it, man. This is how pictures got sent. People would say, and this, this was on the cover of Life, and basically the American public rallied around and said, okay, this is enough. Our rivers really can't be catching on fire. Lake Erie was dead, all right? Now, I've got good news. Lake Erie is no longer dead. You can eat the fish. I've done it. I didn't get sick. And... The Cuyahoga River is no longer on fire, all right? But that doesn't mean we don't concern ourselves. We're done. Hey, we're done. No, we really do need to concern ourselves with pollutant remediation. And so things like uh, pathogens from, um, in this case, waterfowl, all right? And, and this happens to be a picture I took in New Zealand. When they have to put the sign on that says, hey, don't swim here, guys. Go there, but don't mess in here. We had this, you know, and we had the same type of sign you put up in North Carolina where they said, do not swim within 200 yards of this sign. We know what, that doesn't mean jack, right? When it's raining, don't swim here, because the kids, they have an ocean that might seem awesome, and what, but the stormwater runoff, that's where it's at. That's where they want to play, all right? And I, I for one, get it. I, I'm, I'm, I like stormwater runoff myself, but there was an ocean there. And so we got to think about that. And so here is a, an ecosystem called a bioretention cell, all right? It's designed to treat lots of types of runoff, including pathogens. You don't have to be a research scientist to look at the inflows represented by blue diamonds and the F effluent concentration represented by green squares. That in general, the green squares are lower than the blue diamonds. All right? So pathogen remediation, yes, can occur. And then a colleague of mine, University of Maryland, devised this thing. He looked at where do the metals go when they come in here. So 100% of the pie chart is the metals that came in. All right? The, part, the metals that were retained within the media are green. The metals that flowed out are blue. And then the metals that were uptaken or translocated into the plant biomass is in magenta or red or pink, whatever you want to call that color. All right. And you can see in one level that most of the time, or, or mass-wise, very little of the metals actually found their way out. They were almost all trapped in the cells. The green soil, obviously, was containing the majority of it, and some was going to the plants, all right? So a question that then comes like, okay, so are we creating little metal hot spots? I mean, is this gonna become a big problem in the future for us to dispose of? Okay. So a colleague of mine, a couple of you guys know Jeffrey Johnson, this is one of the things that he did. We went back to a, uh, 
a study that I had done a decade and change ago, published it about a decade ago, and looked at how metals had accumulated in this site over the course of the previous 11 years. What was the metal accumulation? So we divided the bioretention cell into these quads and we took a sample of each of these quads at different depths. I want to point out something called the four bay. This is where the water first comes in. The water comes into the bioretention cell, fills up the four bay, and then spreads out across the footprint of the cell. All right, so I wanted to see a number of things associated with, with uh, pollutant accumulation. And essentially, what we found was the following, that it was going to take something between 300 and 1,000 years or more um, of time to pass for us to reach a point where we were hitting even a point of toxicity with metal accumulation in our cell, all right? Now, I'm not one to pass problems down to future generations, but this is one of the ones I'm okay with it. Because honestly, in 300 years, we're gonna have like little lasers, you'll poof, okay, no problem, right? That's why I look, I'm serious, I look at it, if I have time, we're gonna be able to remediate things and it's gonna be awesome. I, I'm not really worried. That's gonna, you know what, you, Pete, you don't even have to worry about it. You're gonna be, unless, unless we're living 200 years, I don't know, do we really, really want to do that? I mean, do you really want to live 200 years? I don't know. They better slow the aging process first, because that's what happens by the time you hit 80, and I'm like, I don't know. I'm all right. That, and by the way, I also point this out. Well, I'll call it okay. Okay, At 45, I'm like, have you hit halfway? When you hit four, the decade of your 40s, so I'm looking at it, I don't really want to. I feel bad. <laughs> Yeah, you're like, are you halfway there? Uh, I may not, I may be gone tomorrow, but at least I was in Coventry this week. <laughs> okay, which gets us now to, and, and so everything, everything I just showed you is, oh yeah, you're designing these practices to improve water quality, all right? You're designing these practices to reduce runoff volumes, check, check. Okay, so what's the, that's exactly what they should be doing. Let's talk about other things, all right? And, and we'll start out with climate change. And by the way, we don't design stormwater practices to help mitigate climate change. Now, we may start designing them to um, tolerate it in terms of or provide flood reduction in bigger events that we might see or more intense events we might see in the future. But do we really think about how they, how they help mitigate climate change? And uh, I'll let you guess, I'm on the last three presidents, one of the three presidents had this executive order, you got it, that's the one, um, that tied in greenhouse gas emissions and stormwater management, okay? And so at this point, it, he basically said, President Obama said, hey, if you're a federal agency, I want you to start thinking about this stuff. Well, as soon as that came out, I have a pretty good relationship with our high, we call it the Department of Transportation. You call it the Transport uh, Highways? Yeah, Highways and Highways in this case. case. One more time. Highways and Highways England, okay, great. So we work with the state of North Carolina's Department of Transportation. By the way, just to put North Carolina and the UK, the, the, North Carolina is almost the exact same size as England. All right, to put it into perspective, exact same size, and probably we probably have about a fifth of the population, we have about 10 million people. How many people live in England proper? England's about 45. Okay, so almost a fifth, not quite. So, we're working with an entity that's about, that has, in terms of number of miles of roads, probably pretty comparable, all right? And I said, hey, Matt, we think about what you guys are putting on the side of your road. There's a lot of vegetation, such as bioretention bowl strips, wetland swales, filter strips. All of that stuff has the potential of sequestering carbon. Don't you think you should start taking, a, you know, should start accounting for it? President Obama says you need to. Well, that was enough to have him find some money for me. <laughs> and, uh, and by the way, if you just want proof, these are soils pre-burn, and here's soils post-burn. And the reason it goes from color A to color B is because there's organics in it, and organic is, is carbon, and that's what's being sequestered in it, all right? So we looked at it by substituting um, time, space for time, essentially we were able to calculate a carbon sequestration rate for roadside filters, all right? And then we did this one thing, we, we said, look, you can have a standard roadside swale or you can have a wetland swale, all right? And let's look at the carbon sequestration associated with that and what we found is Shock City, 
that the wetland swale sequesters significantly more carbon than that of the standard or dry swale. That should not be a surprise at all, but if you're in the Department of Transportation, you're like, hmm. Because you know what roads have? Essential highways have? You know, they all have swales. Unless you're in and around a city, you have a swale. They're thinking, huh. There's a federal mandate for us to start accounting for it. If we start converting our wetland swales, our dry swales to wetland swales, we can sequester more carbon. And so then the next study they went into is, okay, let's try to take our dry swales and make them more wetlandy. And how do we do that? And that was the next study. All right. So now our, our Department of Transportation is trying to think about ways that they can make very simple changes to their cross section to basically squeeze out more carbon sequestration so then they can start having carbon neutral rest stops. We call them welcome rests here. Okay? And they're, they're thinking about this now. And I'm telling you, there haven't been many times in rural North Carolina or the South, or honestly, most of the United States, where decisions for stormwater are being made in part because of carbon. That's where we're going. Speaking of carbon. I'm doing this as just a plug to see if any of you guys might be interested. This is a sh shameless plug. I have a colleague of mine, I have a colleague, that was a redundancy, it's a colleague of mine, that um, has a model that, that he has produced, honestly with one of my grad students, former grad students, that helps you calculate the carbon footprint of development, especially with a focus on stormwater control measures. And, and the way that carbon footprint is calculated is, you have all the carbon associated with getting extracting stuff from the ground, with building it, and with maintaining it. All that's put you up, 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 up in carbon. And then your chance for actually getting a neutral system is how much carbon is able to be uh, sequestered by the vegetation in your stormwater control measure. Okay? And so we've been able to do this and take a look at different types of practices. And remember that constructive stormwater wetland I talked about that was so good at mitigating nutrients? Well, not only did it, does, it, does it do a good job of that, but it shouldn't be a shock that per basic designs engine in North Carolina, it also has the ability to be carbon neutral, actually be a carbon sink, all right? And so you can start looking at practices this way. Now, this model my buddy created, here it is, Carbon Storm, went live in 2016. And then in November, we had an election. And the election surprised people, the result of it. And as a result, he doesn't have a big market for the United States of America, not for right now. But there might be one here in the UK. And if anyone is interested, he's looking to sell his model. Just throwing that out there. You might have some industrialist that's curious. So just let me know. We'll talk. That was my plug for my buddy Sean. By the way, what his model does do is he talks about the, the footprint um, based upon all the carbon emission, how much your stormwater design, what this model essentially allows you to do for what it's worth is you're, start, you're starting able to design stormwater practices so that your development outside of the building, your development's footprint can be made to be carbon neutral or at least mitigated in part. How about the heat island? You all worry about that? Some, I imagine. All right. Certainly as you move south, you do worry about the heat island effect. All right. And a colleague of my, a, another colleague of mine at the University of Tennessee did a study that looked at, hey, you can, you can reduce your temperatures by 2 degrees C at night if you can locate green infrastructure near dwellings. I mean, we kind of already know that, but that's a significant savings in, in uh, energy costs. 2 degrees C at night when people are trying to sleep makes a difference, all right? And so should we not try to start losing green infrastructure to treat stormwater in the city when we can? Another thing. When you build green streets, your goal is to bring people to the streets. But in doing so, you're actually exposing them to particulate matter. And the reason we worry about particulate matter is, well, because people die from it. All right? And admittedly, these pictures are not taken in the UK. They're not even taken in the United States. Though, th I say that. This could, be, this could be LA. All right? But particulate matter is an issue. And there is, uh, you guys, in other universities of the south of uh, 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 you, um, a colleague I've worked with, his name is Prashant Kumar, and obviously it lets me borrow his slides. But he did a study where he looked at green infrastructure, not stormwater green infrastructure, but a hedge, footpath here, a road here, 
and what type of exposure were people having to particulates based upon walking alongside a road. And he looked at it both without any greenery and then in front of the tree, in the middle of the tree, which is probably good for birds and monkeys, and then four, this is you on, on the back side of the tree, to see how much particulate matter was coming from the vehicles to the people. Now, of course, it matters on what one thing that happens you know, when you're outside, you feel it, like the wind, right, the breeze, right? And so the wind can blow this way, the wind can blow this way, or the wind can blow this way. And that matters, all right? Uh, so remember, one and two, basically before the trees, three is in the tree, four is behind the tree. And you can see no matter if the wind's blowing to you, the wind's blowing from you, or the wind's blowing along the road, it really helps for you to have those trees in place. All right. Now, one of the things that was fat, at least at that site in Sturry, we have learned a bit more that when you start looking at street canyons, by the way, bucket list, always wanted to go to Checkpoint Charlie, always wanted to go, finally went, and, and it's the lone picture I had. These dudes are not U.S. soldiers. They're from, they're from Africa. They're getting paid, and it was totally worth it. All right for me at least, but this is, this is a, a street canyon. A street canyon is the following. The height of the buildings is, is higher than the width of the street, okay? And so we might say, okay, let's go put a bunch of trees in here and protect people from particulates, but come to find out that oftentimes, depending upon the, your street canyon and the nature of where your trees are located along the street canyon and how you prune those trees, that you can actually start keeping the particulates held low. They'll bounce off the bottom of the trees and you can actually green your streets up and then expose people to more particulate. Now, I will tell you, I didn't think about that one. I just assumed trees were a good thing. And they are in general. Like, I love trees. I love them. They are in general. But we actually have to be mindful of the types of species we're picking and the type of exposure they may actually end up causing. All right? And there are things like these roadside barriers, other things you can use to help collect the particulates and help them from getting to the people. We've got to start thinking about that. And then what type of stormwater benefits do these systems have as well? Yes, sir. Sorry, no problem. You're talking about particulate, what particular size? 10 and 2.5. 10 and 2.5? 10 and 2.5. Mm-hmm. 10 and 2.5. Okay. And then, and so then other things like, okay, what other types of, of vegetation can you use? And this is a more classical North Carolina picture. And honestly, at this point, this is fine. And we're not really, even if you put trees in, the street width is such that you're fine, all right? The, the issue I think we have to start worrying about uh, with, with uh, using trees and actually exposing to more particulates is truly in the inner city or large cities like New York and London. In Birmingham, we'll just go ahead and throw it to you. Yeah, Okay. Now let's go ahead and talk about biodiversity. And, uh, and it just shouldn't be a shock, the different types of stormwater control measures provide different amounts of biodiversity. And one of the things that we have a lot of in North Carolina, that I saw on the drive-in today, you have a pond with a wetland fringe on it, okay? That is uh, this one right here. And then there's ponds without wetland fringes and there's just straight up wetlands. And we found that if you have a pond with a wetland fringe, you were more likely to have a higher fraction of predators living in the pond. When I say predators, I don't mean like snakes and alligators. I mean benthic stuff that likes to eat, ready? Mosquitoes. Now, I know you're a little further to the north than we are, but when the Zika virus came out, they were showing the spread of the Zika virus. It had its foothold in the south of Florida, and they were like, if it goes unchecked, it will be in North Carolina next year. We're just warm enough that, it, that the mosquitoes can overwinter. And that's an issue. And so don't you think you might want to design facilities, ponds, wetlands, for example, that are at least mosquito resistant? Ecosystem services are at play here in helping shape or frame the design of stormwater control measures. And that's in fact exactly what we did. Okay, other things you can get. This is uh, in Singapore. It is a massive stormwater and river water treating device that they turn into a park, all right? Here is a big park. Actually, I don't know if you guys went there. We went to visit Aaron down in Wilmington, but it's a, uh, make it, I, you guys speak in acres still, don't you? Yeah, 17 acre wetland, constructed stormwater wetland that they turn in. I've actually walked 
the paths of it a couple times. You do X number, you get a mile and all that jazz. All right. So you have this choice here of having a practice that you know you build in the city of Atlanta, for example. You um, you can store all your water underground, all right, or you can use green infrastructure and have something like this. Now, really, which one do you prefer? And I, I've almost laid it up for you. Like, well, I'd rather do that. All right, I'd rather do that. Well, let's talk about some of the benefits of doing that. The, the recreational opportunities, educational opportunities, pointing out where the different storms were to work people. But this practice was put in a, oh, darn it. I want you all to, I want you all to see this slide here. All right, hold on, I'm gonna unhide it. And I want to show it now. All right. So this practice was put in what was generally a somewhat derelict part of town. All right. And they were going to put the big tunnel in here. And they're like, no, 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 no. Let's go ahead and and you can see a lot of the parking lots. And this one here is being used so, but it's kind of a derelict part of town. All right. So they put this practice right smack dab in the middle. You can see it going. You can see it going on right here. All right. There it is. And then you can see some other construction is occurring afterwards, all right? As I go through, new building, new building. And here's your pond, here's your park. And then we'll start pointing out these things that were built after the city of Atlanta invested in their pond. All right, it's a pond wetland thing. Let's take a look. These are all things that were built that were spurred on because of the stormwater investment. A green street. Look at all those new buildings. Here's what I think is amazing. They do the right thing from a stormwater perspective, create a little living space in town, and that all of a sudden spurs on a half a billion US dollars in private investment. We don't think about stormwater devices serving as sort of a hub for private investment, but I've seen it now done twice with success, Atlanta and then in Los Angeles. All right, we need to start thinking about that. Do the right thing and increase your tax base. This is precisely what happened. Okay, Seattle, I'll blow through this one. They had wide streets and they made it a little narrow street. Here it was a big, thick, wide street. It became a, a, a smaller, narrow street. And at first the neighbors didn't like people messing with the street in front of their house. And then they started liking it because they found out that this investment in doing the right thing from a stormwater standpoint was increasing their property values by three to six percent, which they didn't have to do anything, they just had to live there to get. I mean, off-street off parking is a big thing. It, it? It's no, a big deal. Dedicated and they do, and they did have dedicated parking with the revised, and that was an important part of the design. It increased, it increased property value, all right? Montgomery Ward, this is one of my all-time favorite photos. This is, this, this, by the way, is going to start arguing for the greener right out here. All right. This is a picture I took back in 2002. Okay. That article came out, and this was the Montgomery Ward, so um, a retailer, all right, that, had, that, took o that, that owned this building. This was where they would ship all their stuff out of, right? And it, the trains came in underneath what is now a green roof. This was the train shed, and this was the factory, and the people would... And basically, they sold this property to a developer, they put a green roof on, and then all of these became offices. And you can either look onto the roof, option A, or B, look out on, over Baltimore, look over the Baltimore Inner Harbor and whatnot. So the developer here was like, you know, I went ahead and did it because I thought it was the right thing to do, but eh, you know, I got a little grant. Come to find out that, they, that typically views of an internal roof just do not command as much money to let, as y'all say, right? For rental space. This doesn't command as much money. And it takes longer to fill those offices up. He had budgeted to, you know, to make money. He budgeted three years of time to take before all of these offices were occupied, the ones that looked inward. The ones that outward had a much lower time. It took nine months. And so he said that into his first year, he had made back all the money and more, and then some, of the investment to make this a green roof. Again, doing the right thing 
can be, not all the time, all right, even in the closed world of a developer, the right thing to do in terms of finances as well. All right. Here's, I mean, where are we? I'm in the heart, I'm in the heart of football, right? Here's the Swedes who apparently eliminated the Italians. I found that out, didn't I? Uh, and they're taking their dry detention facilities and they're, they're turning them into soccer pitches. Or, sorry, football pitches. You know what, two great nations divided by a common language. <laughs> Permeable payment, you get to park on it. I mean, that's some form of ecosystem service. Well, it's some form of service. Well, not ecosystem service, different story. Rainwater harvesting. You can you can reduce potable potable water demand. This dude is a trip, by the way. If you ever next time you come to America, you're gonna meet Mitch Woodward. That guy's a funny dude. Here's one where in California they collect the water and they take it inside the library and they're letting you know that when you flush the toilets you are using recycled water and you're not, you're, not, you're not taking potable drinking supplies and flushing it down the toilet anymore. Here's one I never had to guess, constructed wetlands. I helped build this wetland. I went back to visit it years later and we get to meet the town manager. He's like, this is the greatest thing. I said, that's so good. Have you had, pro have you had reductions in flooding? Yeah, but that wasn't why he was so happy. He says, do you know that people are getting married here? Brides are coming to have their pictures made here? I, I, look, I never thought of that, and the reason is flowers. These are all naturally occurring wetland flowers. And I know for a fact that from loved ones, dude, they love flowers. At least they love flowers. And, I, I, you know, and might we start thinking now about our constructed wetlands being an amenity and, by, and, and, and actually taking advantage of this market. We're looking at taking ponds and turning them, putting floating islands and ponds to improve their water quality. But now the types of species that we want to use are changing because we're like, you know, we could actually sell these things. Markets. Last but not a bit about provisioning. This is the uh, Fairmont Hotel in Vancouver, Canada. They built a green roof and they harvest their herbs and stuff from the roof. And the restaurant claims that they, the hotel claims that they save $30,000 per year by growing some fraction of herbs and vegetables on their roof as a green roof, all right? I'm like, oh, that's nice, that's nice. But here is where capitalism again speaks. They built another hotel in Toronto and they're adding a green roof to the exact same thing there. People don't throw good money after bad. You may try a good idea once and it doesn't work, eh, that's fine, it worked. This actually, and it may be they use it for marketing. I don't know exactly what the, the mentality went in, but they would not have built another one to do the exact same thing if they didn't see some return on the first investment. Which brings me to the final bit. When we start putting stormwater control measures, stormwater green infrastructure in the ground, we're getting things like air quality, heat island mitigation, some provisioning, okay, aesthetics improvement, education, recreation, all of this, if done well, can lead to an increase in property values. All right, that's the impact, but really if it's done well, it increases property values. The ultimate goal in the end, in my mind, is for us to do the right thing. For us is to put the right type of infrastructure in the ground that we are protecting those people that are coming behind us. I've got five of those people that I love dearly. And the last thing I wanna do is make things worse for them, all right? And I believe that a lot of people, if you could at least get a better sort of full accounting for the benefits that our green infrastructure provide, or provides, um, we'll do the right thing. We just have got to do a better job of accounting for it and valuing it. And basically, who wins by using, you know, by implementing ecosystems as treatment systems? People. But in an absolute sense, obviously, so does the environment. And this is sort of like improving environment through the back door. Because the environment may not vote, but people do. And you help people out, they're gonna help promote the right type of policy. So with that, 
I am happy to entertain questions and um, encourage all of you to take advantage of all those awesome ecosystem services that are out there. Thank you.